Hello students, this lesson is going to be the beginning of a new level. We're going to learn about combinations. Now, combinations are not only the next level for your game in general, but more specifically, it has to do with tactics, because a combination is going to be made up of tactical ideas such as the fork, the skewer, the pin, as well as others that we haven't learned yet. Now, the official definition of a combination in chess is the following. A combination is a forcing variation that normally includes a sacrifice and it's meant to benefit the person executing it, of course. Now, to be honest, when I first learned about this concept, I didn't memorize the definition and I don't expect you to. Just like I don't really mind if you remember the name of the, of the skewer or the pin or the fork, as long as you know the pattern and you recognize it on the board and you can execute it, that's all we need. Of course, you are chess players and you should know the names and, and get them right, but it's not the main objective. Now, when it comes to the definition of combination, there are two main parts that you really have to keep in mind. Number one is the word forcing. When you do a combination, your opponent has to be forced to follow a specific variation. You have to have control of the whole situation. And then the second part is the sacrifice part. Now, although uh, I never learned it like, oh, every combination has to involve a sacrifice, I didn't really think about that, but I need you to be open to the idea that we need to sacrifice pieces sometimes and that that's also an option. And I say this because I have seen that many of my students, they have a hard time sacrificing pieces. Sometimes they just look at a move and they have to sacrifice a good piece and they just ignore it. They don't even look into it because it's so counterintuitive that they don't even want to think about it. Like in this case, imagine I'm thinking of the queen taking the pawn. Now, most people at this point are going to be looking at moves like that and they immediately just uh, ignore it because it just doesn't make sense. You're giving your queen away for this pawn. But I encourage you to just look into it. It just takes a few seconds to imagine what would happen if you did that move. So if I'm playing a game, of course I don't look at every single move, but there are moves that come to mind, especially when it comes to attacking the king. So a move that comes to mind is rook f8. Uh, I'm attacking the king, queen a7. Now I immediately see that this move uh, is going to get me in trouble because I, I lose the rook, but still I look at it. Rook f8, they take me back. Well, I don't have anything else after that. Um, with the queen, if they take with the queen, check, the king takes me, but wait a minute, now the king is exposed, maybe I could put him in check with the rook. And you see, just like that, this was a very quick combination to do checkmate in two moves. Now, if I hadn't looked into this move, I would probably do something like, I don't know, maybe preparing it with rook h5, and then that could get me in trouble. Not only could they put me in check, but they could easily block this. They could push the pawn up, they could go knight f8 to protect the pawn. So you give them time. And that's when the word forcing comes handy. You need to do a forcing move. So again, this is not forcing because you give them so many options from checks to protecting the pawn. If instead we do a move like this, he's forced to take. There's only one move he could do. And he needs to take my queen. So this is going to be checkmate no matter what. And this case is what we're working towards. Now, there are combinations simple like this. It only takes two moves. But in chess, as you get stronger, you're going to experience combinations that are way, way more complicated than this. They involve not only uh, many more moves, but also sub variations. Sometimes you calculate three, four variations, and each variation includes multiple moves. So you end up calculating sometimes over 20 moves. And that's why you see chess players concentrating and thinking uh, for a long, long time. Here we have another position. The first thing I realize is that my queen is pinning this pawn. So I realize the pin, then I look closer and I notice that if my knight went to b3, I would be doing a very nice fork. Now, the reason why this doesn't work is not because of the pawn, because the pawn is, again, pinned by the queen. The problem is that when I go knight b3, this rook could take me. So now I'm thinking, what if the rook wasn't there? That would be a really nice fork. So the next thing that I'm thinking is, what if I could eliminate this rook? And then the only piece that I have right now to put more pressure on the rook is going to be my own rook from d8. So I'm thinking of the move rook d5. And again, remember we're not going to move the pieces 
because in order for you to get better at this, the only way is to do the moves in your head. You need to imagine the pieces moving on the board and it could be difficult at first, but the more we do it, the better you're gonna get at it. So after rook d5, not only am I pinning the rook to the queen, I'm actually attacking that rook with two pieces. So now he's forced to respond to it. And before we actually go deeper into this exercise, I wanted to talk to you about another mental process that we have to use. And that mental process is the following. Given whatever move I'm going to do right now, regardless of what I do, I need to consider my opponent's best responses. And then I have to have a reply for each one of those responses. So now when I do rook d5, I need to determine what are going to be the best move he has. And then I have to have a reply for each one of them. When it comes to combinations, it's not like, oh, it's clear or unclear. No, a combination either works or doesn't work. So I have to make sure that I control every single detail. So after rook d5, um, I'm putting pressure on, on the rook twice again. So his best responses are going to be to either take me with the rook, and that's the one that I'm more concerned with, or I think the only move that they could do is pawn to a4 to protect the rook. So I have to take a look at each one of those moves and have a reply for it. So let me see. If I go rook d5 and he takes me, well, that's exactly what I wanted. Now I could do knight b3 and the rook is not there to take me. This pawn is going to be pinned. So that's going to be a very nice combination to win the queen. Now, the other thing they could do is after rook d5, they could do pawn to a4. And at that moment, I think I could do knight to b3. Because remember, not only am I attacking the rook, I'm pinning it to the queen. So when I do uh, knight b3 now, if it takes me with the rook, well, I get the queen no matter what. Now, as you can see, this was a simple but a very nice combination. And I don't want to make you suffer anymore, but I have to say, um, many players, once they see this combination, they're going to get happy and they're going to be satisfied and they stop right here. So they just execute the combination. The really good players, they actually calculate at least one or two more moves after that happens. But again, I'm not going to make you go through it. I'm just happy that you could see this far. I know for some of you, it's going to be confusing. It's going to be a little bit blurry when you try to do the moves in your head. So this is really good if you've, if you've gotten this far. But let me actually do it on the board now. So rook d5, I'm ready to take on b5. If he takes me, well, knight b3, check, I'm attacking the queen. The pawn cannot take me because it's pinned. Uh, when he moves, and he could go to d1 or to b1 or to b2. If he moves here, well, I take the, the queen, he takes me back, but then here, Notice that we have another tactical idea. We have a fork, so we could go queen b6 and we win even more material. The other option that they had, we said, was um, moving the king to d1. And in that case, we also have another tactic. So pause the video and see if you can find it. Well, if you found another fork, then you get the right answer, queen f3. So this is not a combination, but it's a nice fork. Uh, we attack the king. When the king moves, we get the rook. And then let's go also over this other variation, which is a4. Now we said knight b3, and he cannot take with the pawn. If he takes with the rook, then we get the rook. And notice how all of this was a forcing variation. Okay, to wrap up this lesson, I want you to try this one on your own. It's wide to move, and there is a two-move combination that you could do to deliver checkmate on this king. So remember the mental process. You're going to come up with a move and you need to consider every single reply that they could do. And for any of those replies, you need to have a checkmate. No matter what, it's going to be checkmate in two moves. The other hint that I'm going to give you is that every move you do here is going to be check. So look at the checks that you have and see which one is going to allow you to do checkmate on the next move, no matter what. So take your time, pause the video, and then we're going to go over it. So by looking at this position, I realize my opponent has a battery, so he's ready to do checkmate over here. So this is another indicator that I need to do forcing moves. So I need to do a forcing variation to do checkmate. When I look at my own pieces, I realize I have a battery myself ready to do checkmate down here. But 
this rook is defending that square, so that's not going to work right now. I also have my queen, and I could do two checks with the queen, queen a7 or queen c6. Now, I'm really interested in queen c6 because this is check, and the only piece that could capture me is a rook. So there's a sacrifice involved, but I already see that if the rook takes me, there's no one guarding b8, so I could do rook b8 checkmate because I have a battery. So that would be my checkmate. However, I hope that you also considered what if they go rook b7. Remember, that's the key. We need to consider every single move they could do. Well, if queen c6 and rook b7, then I simply go queen takes b7 checkmate because I have protection from my rook. So for you to see it, um, queen c6, the rook takes, then checkmate. There's nothing they could do. They're forced to either take on c6 or if I go check, they block with the rook and then checkmate. I really hope this wasn't too confusing to you guys and that you could follow the whole exercise. But if it was, please let me know. And this is the only way that I know how you are feeling throughout the course. Uh, just know that the best way to improve uh, when it comes to combinations is to do more exercises like this. So from now on, we're going to be doing a lot of two move combinations, then three move and four move combinations. And that's going to allow you to improve your calculation skills, your visualization skills, little by little.